Simon was a little embarrassed by the attention, especially when he was not doing well, and told the professor that he was trying, but he was not quite getting it. Professor Bahil advised him to use his core and still kept his hand on his shoulder. The professor also pretended to reason with his trademark smile and added that perhaps he was failing because he was not experienced in controlling his core, so his darkness was not firm enough, and as a result, his magic circle that he was creating could not take the correct shape. He also added that Simon cannot learn how to control his core from someone else, it is too basic a skill that is not taught at Kizen, and everyone has different ways of controlling their core, each one comes to this skill on their own. The professor apologized and cast a spell on him. After a moment, Simon felt as if he was in another world, everything around him became different, now Simon could see the movement of darkness and mana in the air. Professor Bahil began to explain to him what was happening and why he felt and saw everything differently. Curses are stereotypically considered to be exclusively negative, but as a professional in this field, he was saddened to hear this, because everyone who thought so was wrong. He had just used the modified sensitivity curse to maximize his senses. Simon had no words to describe what he was seeing around him. Professor Bahil said that this way he could help him find his way and asked him to focus and do what he told him. First, he had to breathe in and gather mana from the air in his body. Simon closed his eyes and concentrated on following the instructions. Next, he had to pass all the collected mana through his core, and the professor advised him to watch how he did it first. And in Simon's imagination, he saw his core moving chaotically, a ball of boiling darkness that was rotating, and he realized how different it was from the movement in the professor's core, where the mana was moving in an orderly and not chaotic way. Bahil asked him if he could feel the difference. He said that Simon's core was not like the others, and if he used it only to produce darkness, it would not be as effective. Therefore, he should develop circulation and not try to tame his darkness and confine it, he should let it flow and move and the professor helped him to tune his core, which now shone in a new way. Bahil advised him to forget about the concepts of transformation, change, and modularity because they would not work for his darkness. He would be better off thinking of his core as a living thing and treating it as such, and collecting the darkness in the core until it starts to release into the environment. Simon began to do as the professor advised him and was fascinated by what he was doing, the darkness appeared in his hands without any effort, and the core was full of energy, like an animal that had broken free from its cage. Finally, Bahil once again advised him not to try to control his darkness by force and just let it do what it wants and said that it was his turn to show that he understood. Simon replied that he would try. He began to gather and concentrate the darkness in his core without restricting it. The professor encouraged him that he was doing a great job. Simon exhaled as he continued to gather the darkness. But at some point Bahil interrupted him and said that he would now lower his sensitivity to 50% and added one more piece of advice. The darkness has a tendency to memorize the flow and move in a similar direction every time. It's similar to how our muscles work, if we repeat something hundreds and then thousands of times, they memorize it and then can do certain actions on automatic. Similarly, after years of practice, the darkness itself begins to perform certain actions without the control of the consciousness. Therefore, it is very important to practice over and over again, training your core and the darkness, bringing every movement, action and spell to automaticity. Simon listened carefully to the professor and memorized his words. Then Professor Bahil suggested that since they had gone so far, he try to create a curse. Simon was still under the influence of the modified sensuality curse, and everything around him seemed to glow for him. Simon agreed to try it and looked at the plant carefully, and the professor added that he didn't have to worry because he would help him. Bahil put his hand on Simon's shoulder and advised him to complete the magic circle as he wanted. Simon agreed. And he began to let the darkness pass through his core and gather it in his hands. Gradually, he was able to form a magic circle in the air in front of him and aimed it at the plant. Bahil praised him and now told him to use the circle. Simon prepared himself and applied the magic circle to the plant, a jet of darkness burst from the circle as he looked at it closely. With a flash, a stream of drops of darkness flew at the plant. At first nothing happened, but then a beautiful blue flower appeared on the plant. But before Simon could rejoice in his success, a giant tree with flowers grew out of the flower, scaring both friends at the desk and making the professor laugh. All the students in the class watched in awe and did not understand what it was or how it happened. The professor only praised Simon and said it was incredible. Bahil told the bewildered Simon that his potential was hard to assess. 
and he just helped him to use his powers efficiently and thus showed him what he would be capable of in the future. Then he removed the modified curse from him. The professor added with a smile that Simon's darkness was special. And he hopes that he will think carefully about his words and find the best way to demonstrate his talent in the future. And he will choose wisely in which direction to move in order to fully realize the potential of his special darkness. Simon thought about the professor's words for a second, but then decided to ask a question. Would he be able to tell him more about the curse he had just created? Professor Bahil smiled at him and thought for a second. Then he answered Simon that he had a great mindset that allowed him to look at himself objectively, and that was wonderful. He had a great curse, but it still lacked something, he needed to add more emotion. Simon realized what he was talking about and asked him another seemingly ordinary question. He asked if he lacked emotion in the same way as when he summoned the undead. But such an ordinary question brought incredible horror to the professor's face, which he could not hide, and his murderous gaze focused on Simon for a moment. But Bahil was able to compose himself and in a second a smile shone on his face and he answered that yes, something like that. Then he patted the confused Simon's head and added that emotions are the most important factor in black magic. In his mind, trying not to show his emotions on his face, he tried to answer the question of what was wrong with the professor's face, it scared him very much. Before leaving, Professor Bahil advised him not to forget his words. He was about to leave when Dick raised his hand and called out to him. He asked the professor to help him, because he, like Simon, was failing, hoping for the same attention and help. But Bahil smiled at him with his trademark smile and told him that hoping for luck and waiting to be spoon-fed is the attitude of lazy beginners and advised him to keep trying. Cammy didn't notice that she had hit Malin on the nose and started apologizing to her. Simon was sitting at his desk looking at his hands and wondering what potential they had. And with enthusiasm and self-confidence, he was going to fully master how to cast a curse by the end of the lesson. At the next lesson, Dick and Cammy sat in the shade of a bamboo tree with other students. Dick asked his friend if it seemed to her that all the professors singled out Simon in a special way and paid more attention to him than to the other students. Cammy asked incredulously, do they? Dick continued to insist that it was true, for example, today Professor Bahil was very kind to him and Simon was definitely able to create the transmission curse only because of that. And now there's also Professor Hongpeng, who at this moment was telling Simon how to do one of the physical exercises correctly and told him to tighten his stomach by pressing on it with his hand. He was also holding his leg wrong and she was correcting his stance with her hands. Simon stood in a kind of heroic pose and could hardly hold back a scream from the tension and from the outside it looked like he had an individual lesson with the professor, which other students were very jealous of and did not understand why the teachers paid so much attention to such a loser. Cammy heard all her friends' arguments and really wondered why the teachers were doing this. Professor Hongpeng, having completed all the corrections and tips for Simon's movements, said that it was time for him to try a pivot kick. But for this kick, he had to use the darkness, which he did by gathering the darkness in his leg. He managed a good kick, creating a whirlwind of darkness around him, which threw leaves and small stones into the air. The professor patted him on the back and told him that he had done a good job, but Simon wasn't so sure, so he asked if it was true and she said yes. But as soon as he was satisfied, she added that only the rotation was good, and the other four poses were wrong, his eyes should be concentrated on the target and he also needed to move his back properly and turn his heels more and the darkness was released too quickly during the stroke. Simon responded to all the comments with a bow and a promise to be more careful in the future, but the professor smilingly assured him that everything was fine and he was doing well, he just needed to practice more. Simon thanked Hongpeng, who finally went to see how the other students were doing, while Malin huffed with disdain at Dick. Then she looked down at him and told him that he was a loser and how he could not call himself a student with such an attitude. Why doesn't he try harder to get more attention from his teachers instead of being offended and whining? He told her that he was not offended at all, but simply asked a question. Besides, who could say, she was the one who was labeled a problem student. Malin reacted very strongly and shook with irritation when she started shouting that she was not a problem student. Dick continued, asking if Professor Hongpeng had even spoken to her in class. If not, it definitely means she is a problem student. Malin denied everything and started threatening him that if he said something like that again, she would put a curse on him. Neither of them paid any attention to Kami, who tried to calm them down and asked them not to fight. They stopped fighting only when Simon came over and Malin, spitting on everything else, was going to throw something at him.
She asked him to come over and teach her, to which Simon was surprised to hear her ask if she was really talking to him. Malin herself was not comfortable asking him, but he was not a bad magical combatant, so since the professor did not pay attention to her, she asked him for help. She mumbled to herself that she had to fight a cyclops in a group presentation, so she needed his help in developing faster moves and then she would get higher grades. Simon told her that she didn't have to explain all this to him and he would be happy to help her just like that, and that she should strike a pose to start with. She thanked him and got into a fighting stance. Simon sat down next to his friends to watch and give her some pointers. But as it turned out, her stance and movements were quite awkward and all her friends felt uncomfortable watching this spectacle. Malin knew what it looked like from the outside and warned them that she knew she was doing very badly. Simon had a few ideas on how to help her and advised her to relax her body and take the most natural pose possible, which should help her get rid of tension and insecurity. Cammy was watching Simon with admiration, wondering how smart he was. Malin, on the other hand, still couldn't get her body under control, her movements were more like a cow dancing on ice than the fighting moves of a necromancer studying at the most prestigious school on the continent. Simon tried to correct the situation a bit with his advice, telling her to clench her fist a little and pull it forward and that her feet should not move but remain in the correct position. Malin had never felt so uncomfortable in her life. When she was more or less able to manage the movements of her arms and legs, Simon encouraged her and told her that she should now gather the darkness around her waist and hold it there. At the time, Dick couldn't believe his eyes and asked Cammy how Malin could be so bad at this. Simon went on to tell her to gather the darkness under her foot and make a turn around her axis. Malin tried, but she didn't get it right. Annoyed, Malin started yelling at Simon that she was doing everything right, but she was not getting it right. Simon exhaled tiredly and tried again to explain to her that she shouldn't just spin on one leg, but tried to make a kick with all her strength and move the darkness by the hip while spinning. Malin still didn't understand what he was telling her, so Simon had to come over and point to where she needed to concentrate the darkness with his finger, but even so, she still had questions. Finally, she lost her patience and yelled at him that her legs were not naked, but in sweatpants and he could come over and show her, not point his finger in the air pointing in the wrong direction. And let him just come over and touch her. Suddenly, after her cry, silence reigned over the entire clearing, and her last line, touch me, echoed across the clearing. Everyone around her froze. And only now she realized what she had said, she stuck her tongue in her mouth and blushed, but the girls behind her had already started whispering what was going on, she had told him to touch her, were they dating or what? But while she was trying to recover, Simon came over and started touching her to show her where she should concentrate the darkness and where she should move when she turned and hit, which only made her blush more. She was about to resist and tell him what he was doing at such an inopportune moment. But he calmed her down and advised her not to think about unnecessary things if she didn't want any misunderstandings, to which she nodded uncertainly and said okay. Then he advised her to gather the darkness where he showed her and try again. She swung and seemed to make a good hit and Simon was about to praise her when. She suddenly lost her balance and fell to the ground under Simon's astonished gaze. He immediately asked her how she was doing and praised her that even though she had fallen, she had done well this time but she still had a lot to learn and needed to practice. She didn't say anything in response, just looked at him with a displeased expression. However, he was immediately surrounded by other girls who had already realized that he was just helping her learn the stance and now asked him to teach them, they all praised Simon for his cool kick at the beginning of the lesson and wanted him to pay attention to them. Meanwhile, Meilin remained sitting on the ground, darker than the storm clouds, wondering who he really was. She couldn't just accept that someone was better than her. After the magic combat lesson was over and Simon was finally able to escape from the girls who all wanted his help in practicing their punches, he and his friends went to the next lesson, his favorite one, Summonology. And the topic of today's lesson was recovery. Professor Aaron began his lecture by telling him about the biggest advantage of skeletons, which was that they can regenerate their strength and structure. Simon, who knew this well, sat at his desk and looked at the bones out of boredom. To prove his point, he wagged his finger. And in a moment, the bones that had been scattered around the classroom by the assistants before the class were now flying past the students, scaring and surprising them. And in a moment, the professor had a whole rat man by his side, and he began to explain that the principle of restoration is very simple. Even when a skeleton's body falls apart from a strong shock or impact, darkness remains in its bones, and he separated the arm from the rat man to demonstrate to the class. 
Professor Aaron held out the skeleton's arm in front of him and began to explain that they just needed to activate the darkness in the bones and maximize its attraction characteristic, which would bring all the bones together into a single original structure. And then he suggested that they start practicing. As it always happened in some analogy classes, the practical part began with uncontrolled skeletons running around the classroom, jumping everywhere and scaring the students. And many of them had no luck with the bones, which refused to obey them and barely moved despite their efforts. Malin noticed that Simon, instead of trying to put his skeleton back together like the other students, was just sitting there reading a book. She asked him if it was okay for him to just sit there. Simon, in order to prove the meaninglessness of her claims, assembled his skeleton with one wave of his hand, which surprised Malin. She had little to say to this and only noticed that he was really good at it. But she still haughtily told him not to get too excited just because of the recovery and asked him if he had forgotten his promise. Simon told her that he hadn't forgotten anything and that she didn't have to worry because he would definitely score higher than her. Malin gave up and replied that if she remembered, then it was fine. She turned away from him and muttered that she would have gotten 90 points on Summonology if she had solved the 20th problem. Simon heard her words and noted that if she was talking about the exam in Professor Jane's office, and the 20th problem was on the last page, it was easy for him. Malin pulled away from him and replied ironically that of course he had solved that problem without even attending the preparatory classes, and what kind of answer did he get? She did not believe it. That he could have done it and thought he was just pretending. But Simon remembered the answer and said it right away, 1,200,146. This made Malin's jaw drop in amazement. They did not notice that the teacher's shadow was already hovering over them and had been listening to their conversation for some time. Malin was about to ask how he could have gotten that answer when they were suddenly interrupted by the professor's voice, which called out the name Simon Falencia. He asked what he was doing now. Simon was startled by this unexpected appearance and immediately realized that he had been caught red-handed. While Malin froze, Simon began to make excuses that he had restored the skeleton and began to review the material in the next class in the book. Professor Aaron did not seem to be satisfied with this answer at all and met it in silence. And then he added that Simon should stay after class. The friends were upset by the news and Malin began to apologize, but it was too late and nothing could be changed. After the lesson, Simon and Professor Aaron were left alone, Simon sat not knowing what to expect and the professor read a book sitting on a chair. After a few minutes of silence, the professor slammed the book shut and told him to follow him. They left the school grounds and approached the edge of the forest, and when they were almost there, the professor said that he could not tolerate only a few things. And one of them is students who don't attend his classes even if they want to. Simon did not understand what he meant. The professor told him to take his skeleton, Simon clenched his fist to activate subspace and get his skeleton. As soon as he took it out, the professor snapped his fingers and it shattered into pieces. He then asked Simon to reassemble it in front of him, which he did. And in a moment, there was a whole skeleton standing in front of him again, but he had seen this thousands of times before, so it didn't make any impression on him. He continued casually that Simon really has a talent for restoration. And he added that he would teach him another skill. This surprised Simon, who was expecting anything but an extra lesson. He asked the professor if he was going to punish him for not paying attention in class, but the professor looked at him in disbelief and then asked what he was talking about. And then he said that this was an extra lesson especially for him. And he just said it in class so that other students wouldn't misunderstand him. He was not going to punish him at all, but rather the role of a professor is to give students who are more capable than others additional chances. This news made Simon shine with happiness. But the professor didn't want to take too long, so he told him to get into a fighting stance. The first thing that Professor Aaron showed him was a skeleton made of bones of a demon in armor, and Simon could not contain his admiration for its coolness. The professor began to take it apart and warn Simon to pay attention, because he would not show him twice. Then he confidently raised his hand and pointed his finger in the direction of the tree opposite, an aura of power surrounding him. At his command, the bones began to stir in such a way that the sharp parts were separated from the rest. In a moment, only the sharp parts of the skeleton were hanging in the air in front of him, pointing at the tree with the squirrel. The professor explained that this is an attack skill that uses the recovery skill. And he fired those bones, which flew to the target with a whistle. All of them hit the target with a bang, scaring the squirrel sitting in the tree. Aaron explained to Simon, who was fascinated, that this skill is called piercing bone. 
The frightened squirrel ran away from the tree in tears. Aaron wasn't going to let it go far and wanted to use it as an example, so he waved his hand. And the squirrel was surrounded by a cage of bones, the professor explained that this is another skill related to recovery. And it is called bone prison. The poor squirrel did not understand why he deserved such a fate. But the professor continued that finally. And he made a rotational movement with his hand. And all the bones surrounding the squirrel flew back to the professor. The defense skill, with a creak, the demon's bones began to put on his arm like armor. And finally, in a moment, he was completely in bone armor and looked very epic. Simon was shouting out how cool it was. The professor gradually began to take off the armor and explain that, depending on the necromancer's abilities, a skeleton can become a weapon, armor, and prison. All the black magic skills that he had just shown Simon were in addition to the restoration skill and then asked if Simon understood everything. He replied that he did. The professor added that these techniques are usually taught in the second year of training, but he decided to show him earlier because he had already achieved excellent results in recovery. And he was going to teach Simon how to use them earlier. He was very grateful and excited about this opportunity. Aaron advised him to train the piercing bone first, but before that he needed to get rid of one bad recovery habit. Simon didn't know what he was talking about. The professor explained to him that the essence of recovery is to send the skeleton back to its current location. And his recovery instead puts the skull in the center and rebuilds the skeleton around it. In other words, instead of moving the fully restored skeleton, he has to set his will from the beginning so that the skeleton is restored immediately in the right place. Simon thought that this was similar to what Feyer had told him and he might be able to do something similar to ordering the skeleton. Simon looked at his hand surrounded by darkness and thought, well. And pointing to a spot on the surface in his mind, he ordered the skeleton to gather in front of him. For a moment, the skeleton hesitated with creaking bones, not understanding what was being asked of it. However, after a few seconds, the skeleton began to gather in front of him, though not in a hurry and waving at him with its paw. But eventually it fully assembled and stood up in front of Simon. The professor commented that it wasn't as terribly slow as it could have been, so they could move on. Restore and pierce bone are two different skills, the latter is simply an addition to the restore power, so he should think of them as two different things. Simon took apart his skeleton and tried to separate some bones from others. The professor advised him to get into the habit of turning the bones around while healing, so that their sharp ends would pierce the enemy's flesh. And if he also focuses the darkness in the bone in one direction, he can make it sharp as a blade, and he took one bone in his hand and showed how the darkness concentrated at one edge sharpened it. And for those parts of the skeleton that do not have elongated sharp edges, he advised to make them into motion limiters and said that they would have a good effect. To confirm this, he used the tail as handcuffs and pulled Simon's arms down so that he fell to the ground. Then he released him and told him to try it himself and pointed to one of the trees. Simon pointed the bones of his skeleton at it, which crunched and wrapped around him like a bone snake. Simon gathered all his strength, clenched his fist and shouted, Recovery! The bones began to crunch against the wood. And at some point, with a loud crunch, they broke it in half. Simon was happy that it worked and now the whole lawn was littered with pieces of rollers and wood. The professor praised him for doing a great job. But he noted that so far he was basically just strangling his opponent with bones, but since he was rebuilding the collapsed skeleton into an attack method, it gave him a new trick. And if he continues to train, he will be able to use this skill in real combat. Simon was happy that he was getting the hang of it so quickly. Then Aaron told him that he had heard that Professor Jane had chosen Cyclops for the group test and asked if he would fight. Simon told him that he would not be fighting, his partner Malin would be fighting instead. The professor said that this was a smart move and it was important for him to focus on supporting his friends, he still had a lot to learn, so he had to do his best. And as he was about to leave, he added that it was just an extra lesson and nothing more. Simon only managed to thank him, looking at his back as he walked away into the shadows of the forest. Simon returned to the school and went to the laboratory where his friends were about to make a poisonous paralytic potion. He walked in smiling and apologizing for being late. Immediately, his frightened friends ran up to him, who were very worried about him and now bombarded him with questions, what happened, was he beaten, and how could the professor dare to punish him, because it was the period of student protection and it was forbidden to use physical punishment, especially Cammy was screaming and worried. Dick said that he had heard that this is how physical violence starts at Kizen. 
And Malin was beating herself up that it was her fault for asking him that stupid question. Simon just tried to calm them down. He told them that the professor did not punish him, but gave him an extra lesson. His friends were very surprised and looked at him questioningly. And then they immediately pretended to lose interest in him and went back to their potion, saying that the professor probably just confused the extra lesson with a punishment and that since he was not injured, they did not care. They were doing this to show that they didn't care about him and were only worried about him because he was on their team and they needed him to be healthy. Malin was stirring her golden colored potion and her friends praised her for making the highest quality poison. To which she huffed and replied that it could only be so because she was the one who brewed it and the amount of water, the measurement of the ingredients, the boiling time and the separation of side substances, in short. Everything was done perfectly. She added, smiling, that all that was left was to simmer for 20 minutes and it would be ready. Her friends enthusiastically replied that they knew they could rely on her and that they had all worked hard to prepare it and hoped it would be effective. Malin replied that she knew it would, and with this potion they might even do well in their next lesson of elementary black magic. Dick added that since they were all here, they should prepare for the presentation. Everyone supported his idea. Later, late at night, someone asked if they had gone through all the possible questions. He was told that yes, more than 300 questions and they had an answer for each of them. They all sat around the table exhausted, trying to encourage each other that they would succeed and that tomorrow's presentation was in their pocket. But their joy was very sleepy. The next morning in class, the professor looked at the text version of their presentation and slammed it down. Summarizing, she said, one damager, one support, and two on curses, she stated that the members of their group had different profiles, but not roles. In addition, their black magic combo lacks creativity. She also added coldly that their idea of putting the main damager in the support position was not very good. At the same time, the professor was thinking about what the members of this team were thinking. And they were all disappointed because of the time they had wasted and the sleepless night and the fact that she had not asked any of the 300 questions they had prepared for. Vice Chancellor Jane, ignoring the students' confusion, turned to the students and asked them why they had assigned roles in the way they had. Speaking up Malin replied that she thought it would be best for them to have a clear division of responsibilities as the most important goal for them was to defeat the Cyclops. Upon reflection Vice Chancellor Jane asked if that was the best division in their group. To which the girl replied in a confident voice that it was. Simon, meanwhile, was nervously clenching his fist behind his back, trying to look calm. The next moment Professor Jane turned to Simon and asked him what he thought of their strategy. He understood that the professor must have been expecting a different answer, but in any case it was about protecting the team members. Besides, the purpose of today's presentation was to evaluate their strategy, and that was why he had to show how good their teamwork was. Making up his mind, he turned to Vice Chancellor Jane and said that he knew that their team lacked ingenuity in terms of combining dark magic. However, he added that safety was still the first priority, as this way the Cyclops hunt in their squad would be more stable than the other groups. That allowed them to thus get a high score for strength, which made up for the lack of points for resourcefulness. Nodding in response, Professor Jane said that if they had decided so, then so be it, adding that they should now move on to the next item. Then turning to Kami who, not expecting such attention, excitedly replied that she was listening. Vice Chancellor Jane asked why, despite the fact that she was studying hematology and should have been responsible for the attack, she had given that role to a catarology student while she herself was acting as a support person using curses. Adding at the end to a frightened and confused Kami that she would like to hear her thoughts on the subject. It was a difficult question not only for the girl, even Malin and Dick looked unsure as they realized that answering it would not be easy. Besides, the question had been asked by Kami, who was not known for her confidence. Concerned Malin, who was standing nearby and chewing for her, told her not to be nervous and tried to answer confidently. However, she still could not get a word in edgewise. Simon suddenly came to her aid, calling out to her in a whisper and saying one word, Cyclops. Adding something about a toxicology class. Hearing this, the girl immediately understood everything, and her wings began to move confidently again. And the next moment she said in a firm and confident voice that such a decision was made because of the unique nature of the Cyclops, against which they would fight. Upon hearing the answer, Professor Jane immediately asked her to explain in more detail. The girl nodded and began her explanation, saying that since Cyclops had hard and tough skin, and hematical spells were more for physical damage, it would be hard to defeat Cyclops that way. 
Listening to Cammy's words, Hector thought about something while the girl continued her explanation, saying that Malin could use the dark element flash, and that was why she thought they could burn the Cyclops with her spell. Finishing by saying that this was why Malin was best suited to be the attacker against the Cyclops. Malin, however, looked at her friend with a smile as she was still able to answer such a rather difficult question perfectly. Professor Jane said that she understood her explanation, and then asked what they would do if their opponent was another monster. Hearing such a provocative question, Cammy started muttering something to herself again, not knowing how to answer. However, in the next second, she said in a loud and excited voice that she would then go on the offense. There was silence in the classroom after her words. Simon and Malin looked at the girl in shock, unable to say anything. Cammy realized that she had made a loud statement and covered her mouth with her hands. Hearing the answer, Professor Jane nodded her head and smiled slightly and said that she would remember her words. Then she turned to Dick, saying that it was his turn. He did not hesitate to raise his hand and said he was ready. But a question of a slightly different nature awaited him. Professor Jane turned to him in a slightly irritated voice and told him not to talk to the student sitting next to him during the lesson. To say that Dick was shocked is a very meager description of what he experienced. The professor, on the other hand, turned to the entire number 7 team and said that they were free to go, then announced that the number 8 team could go forward. After a while, the students in the academy cafeteria were having a good time, discussing their school life. Simon sat at a table by the window, his head propped on his arm, staring out the window, wondering when the man he had an appointment with would arrive. He added to himself that anyone of any value should see her today. At the same time, several students stared in surprise at the entrance. They exclaimed in surprise at the sight of the visitor, wondering who she was. A rather tall slender girl with black hair walked past the students without turning around, heading to the end of the cafe. It was none other than Lorraine Archbold. Noticing the students staring at her, she turned around and asked in a cold voice if they had anything to say. Those who didn't want to mess with her immediately ran away fearfully. While Simon looked at the whole thing in bewilderment. Looking again at the girl in front of him, who was now dressed in her school uniform, Simon was surprised to note that he had a strange feeling, as if a completely different person was sitting in front of her, and that she was a little frightening. Memories came flooding back to Simon. Back to when they first met. She seemed very friendly, they went shopping together and if together. Returning to reality after the warm memories, Simon embarrassedly said hello to the girl. Lorraine leaned on his arm and sighed. The next moment, with a bright smile on her face, she turned to Simon and greeted him cheerfully, adding that it was the first time they had seen each other since Langerstein. Then turning to the confused and shocked Simon, who didn't understand how it was possible to change so much in one moment, she asked him how he was doing. He replied that he was fine. Remembering the joy of the girl who had given him the letter, Warren asked him in a dissatisfied voice what he had said to the girl who had made a big fuss about it. He replied that he had just asked her to give the letter to him, not understanding what had happened. Simon turned to Lorraine and said that she looked great in her school uniform, even better than he'd expected. She misunderstood his words and asked in a disgruntled voice if he thought she looked old. Simon, realizing that he'd misspoken, apologetically replied that he hadn't meant that. Then he nervously started gesticulating with his hands, pointing at himself, trying to explain that she seemed a little unusual in her school uniform in Langerstein. The girl laughed and replied that everything was fine and she was just kidding. She added that he shouldn't have been so nervous. Then folding her hands in front of her, she asked him with a serious expression on her face why he wanted to see her. Deciding not to drag it out, Simon immediately told her that Kizen had a traitor. After asking her if she knew about Professor Jane and her assignment to fight the Cyclops, he told her about a situation that had happened to him while he was hiking in the woods. After listening to Simon's story, Lorraine sat silently thinking about something. Simon decided that she found it hard to believe what he had told her, but she interrupted him and said that she believed him. Then she asked him to tell her more about the cross he had seen. Simon replied, remembering with difficulty, that the largest cross seemed to be in the center. Then he added, after a moment's thought, that there was a woman on it, tied to it with a vine. Hearing his words, Lorraine replied that it was obvious that the woman was the goddess Dave, who was the only goddess the saints of Ethnol believed in. Not understanding what the girl was talking about, Simon asked who were the saints of Ethnol. She replied that it was a holy college that was run by the Holy Father himself. While Kizen trained necromancers, Ethnol trained priests. 
The holy maidens were considered the strongest in the holy federation. They only took ethnal girls to them, and they also kept the entire power of the federation with them. Lorraine, on the other hand, clutched the innocent glass that had cracked. She screamed furiously how a reaper could dare step into Kizen. The girl turned to Simon and asked who else knew this information, but he said that it was only him and Kami, who had gone into the forest with him. Lorraine replied that she would immediately report everything to her mom. Hearing this Simon thanked the girl. Standing up from the table, Lorraine said that telling her was the right thing to do, since it was just as he said, the priest was likely to be as strong as the professors, which made all Kizen professors suspects. After which he added in a cheerful voice that if he had already spoken to them, they could already have destroyed all the evidence or hindered the investigation. It was so that her mother could know about it, so that the priest couldn't interfere, and so that they could do a thorough investigation in peace, to which Simon replied with a smile that he was happy to help. As soon as they got up from the table, Loirain immediately said with a smile of confidence that they should be on their way. Simon, confused, asked where they were going. She smiled and replied that they were going to the Forbidden Forest. Where he'd seen the priest, there would be evidence of him. Simon said with a smile on his face that it was a good idea. Getting to the place where he last saw the priest, Simon looked around the place and couldn't believe what was in front of him. Why is there nothing here? He asked in a shocked voice, standing in the middle of the forest where there was no trace of the night before. As Simon stood still, Lauren walked past him, shocked at what he'd seen. Leaning down and running her hand over the ground, she said that without evidence it was even more suspicious, then added that, as he had said, the priest was quite strong. Even though she hadn't seen the fight, it was still clear to her how thoroughly the footprints had been covered. What was even more shocking, though, was that they had placed the core inside to come to Kizen, even though they were serving a god. Explaining that the priests believed that the core was a power that negated the god. Interrupting the girl Simon said he had a question, to which the girl turned around and asked what he wanted to ask. Simon asked in an unsure voice, if you open the core, then being a priest you can't use holiness, right? To which Lorraine nodded her head and replied that it was, adding that she didn't know the exact principle, however those claimed it was so. Claimed? Simon asked in surprise, turning to the girl. She explained that holiness was the power that came from faith in God. Darkness was the power of the damned devil, which was what the priests believed in. Then adding that whatever their theory was, there was no denying that the two forces were fighting each other. Suddenly turning to Simon and putting a hand on his shoulder, Lorraine thanked him with a serious expression on her face for his cooperation with Kizen, but added that the problem was that the priests were not to be underestimated, which meant that his life was in danger because they didn't know when they would come for him. Then he suggested that he take the day off and rest. Simon replied with a smile that he was grateful for the offer, but said that everything was fine and he would go on with his life. He added that he didn't know if the priest had seen his face or not, so if they came after him they would definitely leave evidence. The girl was shocked by his words. Then she grabbed him and angrily told him to stop talking nonsense, because even if they had evidence, it wouldn't make any sense if he was dead. However, Simon put his hands on the girl's shoulders in a calm voice and told her to calm down and listen to him carefully, then said that if he stopped going to classes or doing anything strange, the priest would probably suspect him right away. Lauren, who couldn't accept this, replied that he should at least be accompanied by keys and guards. However, Simon replied in a firm voice that it applied to those as well. He would stand out a lot if he had guards following him, which would make it obvious that he had told everything to the top Kizen, and also showed that he felt threatened. They were also dealing with a priest who had infiltrated Kizen, who as she said decided to come here and even open the core, which was considered sinful. Simon also added that she should realize that these fanatics were unpredictable. To which she replied, not too cheerfully, that she agreed. But on one condition, if she noticed anything suspicious, she would protect him, even if it restricted his freedom. Having no choice he replied that he agreed. Lorraine added in a cautionary voice that he should remember not to sacrifice himself for everyone else. He laughed awkwardly and replied that he would remember that. Since they had already checked everything out and there was no point in staying here, they decided not to drag it out and head back to Kizen. It was already dark outside, but the bright moon in the sky kept the darkness from completely engulfing everything around them. With a smile on her face, Lorraine waved goodbye to Simon, adding that they would see each other soon. Simon looked at her as she left, apologizing to her, because he couldn't take a sabbatical just for the sake of it. If he did, 
he would probably fall behind if he didn't go to class. Besides, he could be expelled for bad grades or bad skills, which he could not allow, and since there was risk on both sides, he felt the best choice for him was to keep his academic life. Besides just like Feyer said, there was a lot to learn in Kizen, and so there was no way he could miss such an opportunity. Being in the cylindrical transparent elevator, which looked very modern, the students inside were looking at it with interest and amazement. Dick, standing beside Cammy, said in amazement that Professor Jane really lived up to her reputation. He added that he had heard that it usually happened in the second semester, but they could try it earlier even before the freshman defense period was over. An excited Cammy, on the other hand, replied that she was so nervous that she still couldn't sleep. Suddenly, a bright blue light flashed, causing the students to cover their eyes with their hands. Then someone's artificial voice sounded, which said that it was a virtual battle system. And it was called Avalon. It was a system that was the only one on the entire continent. It could recreate any monster in the form of a magical creature for virtual combat. After descending into the very room of the system, the students looked around in admiration. Standing in the middle of the room, which was made in the form of a cube, Professor Jane said that this system was the result of the relocation of Galliotson, which was an ancient fortress of illusions and hallucinations, which was already in Kizen modified for the needs of the academy. Finished with the explanations, she decided to move on to the evaluation briefing. The rules were the same as in practice, at most they could face three virtual battles before the real match. Also the virtual Cyclops would only consider the fighting group as enemies. After that, showing all the students a black vest, she said that they would all wear them since those had a barrier spell cast on them. The training would end as soon as the barrier dropped to zero, then the dropout could wait for their next turn in the waiting room. After saying that in this virtual battle they were to evaluate how well their strategy worked, as well as experience what real combat was like. Finished with that, Professor Jane ordered everyone to go to their assigned waiting rooms. Standing in their waiting room in front of the screen that displayed everything that was happening on the battlefield, Simon and Cammy looked at the screen with interest while the voice of the system informed them that they would mark their auxiliary positions. Looking at the screen Simon noted that Cindy was in the fifth team, then looking at what their team specialized in he concluded that they had a good balance. The next second a voice announced that the fifth team's fight was starting. At the same moment Cindy and her team were standing in their positions right before their eyes the world around them began to change. Suddenly a foot stepped on the ground, making the ground around them shake slightly. As expected, Cindy was a little confused when she saw the huge Cyclops, because even though they had prepared for it, seeing such a monster even in virtual reality was a challenge. But in the next second, Cindy came to her senses and jumped back a little, pulling out her weapon at the same time. She said with confidence in her voice, pointing her finger at him, that she would definitely defeat him. However, reality was cruel, and despite her fervor and confidence in victory, Cindy lay unconscious on the ground while her comrades ran to her worriedly. The simulation failed at 1 minute and 16 seconds, while the damage done was 22%. Dick, who had been watching the fight through the screen, said thoughtfully that since the Cyclops strike had removed half of the barrier at a time, they would have to use curses sooner than they thought. Kimmy folded her hands together worriedly and said that many of the boys were nervous, even though the fight was virtual. Walking up to Malin and turning to her a little abruptly, Dick asked if she was going to be okay, to which she replied in a firm voice that she was fine despite being worried. After the last fight was over, the system voice announced that the next groups to fight were 7 and 8. Simon and Hector looked at each other. Simon, who was about to leave, was called by Hector, who asked him if he was an attacker in their group. Simon turned around and said that Malin was their attacker. Hector was furious and called her the stupid girl from Ivor's tower and asked Simon if he had changed his mind about protecting her pride. However, he answered without even turning around that it was not so, and then said that she was simply the best fighter among them. Hector was furious when he heard that. Simon, Malin, Dick and Cammy walked down the corridor towards the exit, which was glowing with a bright light. A system voice addressing their group reported that they had marked their auxiliary positions. Then three yellow circles appeared on the ground in front of the group, one of the assistant professors turned to the guys and told the support members to take their places. Reminding them that Cyclops would not be able to see them, he added that they could relax, but they were immediately disqualified if they left the circle. Then turning to Malin the assistant asked if she was ready. To which the girl replied a little excitedly that she was. 
Seeing the girls' nervousness Simon together with Dick and Cammie wanted to support her and told her to try not to be nervous as it was just a virtual fight, adding that she would succeed. Thanking the guys for their support she sighed and went back to her seat. Then the system voice announced that the simulation of Group 7 had begun. And the next moment their group stood in the middle of a virtual forest in front of a huge cyclops. Cyclop gave a loud roar when he saw Malin. Malin immediately told everyone to get ready in a firm voice. Reminding them to stick to their strategy, which they had developed especially for this fight. Simon clenched his fists and tried to calm down, since Malin was fine they didn't need to worry and just followed the plan. Standing in front of the huge monster, each of the guys said to themselves that they had to concentrate 100% on their role. However, in the next moment, something lightning fast struck in front of them. And in the next moment, Malin disappeared. Not realizing what happened all three of them turned their heads in bewilderment in the direction where the girl was supposed to be. Malin was lying motionless on the ground, listening to the concerned cries of her companions, who asked her if she was all right. Then the system voice announced that the first virtual battle of the seventh group was over, praising them for their excellent work, he noted that they had done everything as planned. However, for the tired and broken guys, it was not a very nice praise. The system also noted that they were most impressed that the summoner was able to distract the cyclops with the skeleton. Hearing the praise Simon thanked the system voice. However, to their surprise the system continued. Concluding that the rest of the squad had performed much worse. Saying that the strategy of holding the enemy by attrition and winning by darkness sounded good in theory, but in practice, as they had already realized, it was much more difficult. Their biggest problem was their lack of skill. Advising the guys to reduce the number of misses, the system finished analyzing their fight, saying that that was all. The guys realized their mistakes and thanked the system voice. After that they went to the waiting room, where the other students crowded around the screen and watched something admiringly. As expected, the screen showed Hector standing on a defeated Cyclops with his lower body missing. Some of the students admired him enthusiastically, talking about how tough and strong he was. But praise Hector was really for what he was able to kill the monster on the first try, and in addition, for all this time, the Cyclops has not once hit the guy. The students continued to marvel, thinking about how hard they had to work to get the highest score, and wondering if it was even possible. While Simon's group watched the screen with interest, Hector, already back from the battle, walked over to them. Walked over to them, attracting Simon's attention. Who looked at Hector and saw only a gloating grin on his face as he walked past. Simon didn't have time to pay attention, however, because the next moment Mei Lin turned to them all. With fierce determination in her eyes, she firmly stated that they should try their best to win the next fight. A short while later on the second attempt, the huge Cyclops swung his huge club, intending to strike, while Dick, who saw that even two curses of exhaustion were not slowing the monster down, shouted to Mei Lin that she should dodge. Telling her to remember what they'd learned in magic combat classes. Hearing his words, Mei Lin used all of her strength just a second before the blow hit her, and she dodged it. At the same time, Dick turned to Kami, who, like him, was using the exhaustion curse on the Cyclops, and told her that they should use the persistence formula, as it was very important to combine the effects of their curse. To which she nodded affirmatively. The new unified curse then hit the Cyclops with renewed force, causing it to cover its face with its hand and roar furiously, while Mei Lin, who landed on the ground unluckily, cried out painfully as she fell on her back. At the same moment, the Cyclops recovered from the curse and swung his huge club at the defenseless and unsuspecting girl sitting on the ground. One of the guys shouted for her to dodge, but it was too late for that, as soon as she raised her head the only thing she saw was a huge baton at a great speed flying towards her. The screen displayed the result of their second attempt. Their final score was E while the damage dealt was 42%. Walking beside Mei Lin, Kami said with a concerned voice that this attempt was pretty close, then added that the next one was the last one. To which Mei Lin replied that she knew. At the same time, Simon stood pensively, turning to the guys. Said with a happy and confident face that he had an idea on how to beat them. He then went on to give the details, saying that first of all the basic plan was the same, the two of them would cast curses while Mei Lin would use a flash of darkness, but since the double depletion didn't really work, Simon said that Kami and Dick should use a four-layer depletion with multiple formulas. Dick said confusedly that he'd never done anything like that before, while Kami added in an uncertain voice that it was impossible because they wouldn't have enough time to do it. 
to which he replied in a confident voice that time was fine, as he would buy them as much time as possible with the help of the skeleton. Having no other options everyone agreed to the proposed plan. Some time later on the battlefield during the third attempt, two skeleton mice started climbing Cyclops' legs, distracting him and also trying to do some damage. Besides, while discussing the plan Simon suggested to use the terrain in their favor. He also asked Dick if they could use his special sorcery, so he said yes. At the same time on the battlefield, Kami, having created a magic circle, reported that she had created the first curse of exhaustion. Dick also reported that he was already moving on to the next stage. While Simon's skeleton was destroyed by the Cyclops' fierce attack, Marilyn reported that the Dark Flash was 80% complete. Simon, realizing that he needed to keep distracting the monster, summoned two more skeletons again. He sent them into battle against the Cyclops, even though they couldn't do much damage, they still did a good job of distracting him. After a while, Kami, who was holding an exhaustion spell in both hands, said she was done, and a couple seconds later Dick said he was ready. Hearing this Simon said that this was great news, adding that they were now moving on to the next part of the plan. The shattered skeleton in Cyclops' hand glowing with blue light began to fall to the ground. The monster, sensing something wrong, began to turn his head in search of what was causing it. The danger that made the Cyclops' instincts go on alert was Malin, who held a large red spell in front of her and loudly announced that the Dark Flash was ready. Seeing the girl in front of it, the monster let out a very loud roar, after which it immediately rushed towards the girl. As soon as the monster was within the radius of the exhaustion curse, Dick along with Kami simultaneously used it on it. At the same time, Malin shouted furiously and applied a Dark Flash. The monster's frightened gaze reflected the combined attack of all the guys. In the next second, the monster was hit by a huge stream of fire created by the Dark Flash. Turning to the girl, Simon said that with four attrition spells, she should have been able to deal with the monster's blows. Hearing his words, Malin asked in an uncertain voice if he wanted her to go after the monster herself, but Simon said no, adding that he would tell her when it was time to follow her lead. The girl agreed with Simon and said she would try, then concentrated the darkness in her feet. The next moment the monster struck, but thanks to Simon's timely warning the girl managed to dodge the attack. Despite the fact that the monster had been attacked so hard, it was still on its feet, and even continued to try to attack Malin, who had risen to her feet and was running away. Dick used another curse of exhaustion, trying to keep the monster from chasing the girl. Simon shouted to Kami to block the Cyclops' vision with a game tick spell. The girl shouted that she understood, then she put her hand forward and used the blood to form a red spell on the end of her finger. After which it formed into a red streak and shot towards the monster. The next moment it wrapped itself around its head, limiting its visibility, giving it a chance for a successful attack. At the same moment Dick shouted to Simon to begin. Seeing that the monster had not yet regained consciousness and was quite close, Simon ordered his two skeletons sitting in the tree waiting for the right moment to begin the operation. The next moment a metal chain was slipped around the neck of the Cyclops. Who, unable to see anything in front of him, stumbled against it. As it turned out, the skeletons stretched it between the trees, pulling it down without giving the monster a way forward. The furious monster growled angrily and grabbed the chain, trying to break it. When Simon saw this, he shouted to Dick to use sorcery to strengthen the chain. To which he agreed to use it to amplify the chain. The next moment the chain glowed with a blue magical glow, and the Cyclops, sensing that he could not break the chain, roared furiously. However, it did not intend to retreat and continued to move by tightening the chain. However, at the same moment, Simon turned to Malin and shouted to her to finish the monster off. Shrouded in the red aura of the magic circle, she clenched her teeth and angrily told the monster to just die. Then with a fierce and confident expression on her face, she raised the magic circle above her. She unleashed the full force of the attack on the monster, which plunged into the red flames and roared painfully. At the same time, the rest of the group looked at the Cyclops in anticipation, who burst into red flames and gave a painful growl. After a while, the flames began to disappear, leaving behind a burned monster, which stopped growling for a second froze in place. However, in the next moment, he fell face first to the ground, beginning to disintegrate into hologram particles. The screen displayed the result of the battle. As a result, team number 7 was able to complete the challenge in 6 minutes and 48 seconds with only 3% damage. However, judging from their joyful faces, they didn't care much about the score. 
Gathering together and hugging each other, they smiled with joyful smiles on their faces as they were happy that they had succeeded.